So, um, getting into something today that I think that uh, relates to every one of us. Uh, so if you will turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, we will begin in verse 14. And I have entitled the message, A Betrayal of Trust. Um, let me ask everybody here, anybody here know of anybody that has a relative or is named a relative? Judas. Hmm, you ever think about that? Of all the names that are out there, even non-Christians, you don't hear anybody named Judas. Why? Because he was named for one thing. One town colored boy on the boat. His name was Jesus. You had a you had a guy named Judas. Hope he was a good guy. <laughs> I've never met anybody named Judas. There's one. That's that's a new one on me because that's the first one I've heard of. But Judas was known for what? Betraying Jesus. I want to discuss that today, but I want to discuss it not so much about Judas. We all know that story well. We know how he betrayed Jesus, and we will touch on that. But I want to look at it more in the light of our lives. Because I feel safe to say that there's not a person sitting here today, or standing here today, that has not been betrayed by somebody at least once in your life. So that's what I want us to look at today. You know, God gave us these messages not just to give us good stories, because they're true, but he gave us these messages to look at these messages to see how they relate in our life and to help us get through life. So, it said, One of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest, and he said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. The price of a slave, by the way. For then on he began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. If I were to ask you this morning for a show of hands, I'm sure I would see every hand in here go up if I'd ask you one question. Have you ever been betrayed by someone? I don't think there's a person sitting out here this morning that wouldn't raise their hand if they were truthful. Have you ever been betrayed by someone? You know, there's all kinds of different situations we can imagine. One of the worst, I think, in God's eyes is when a husband betrays his wife or a wife betrays the husband by being unfaithful. And it's not necessarily being unfaithful. I think there's ways you can betray your mate um, without being unfaithful. Um, you know, sometimes you can kill the mate's uh, self-worth. You might even kill a little bit of the love uh, if the mate happens to see you looking at other people of the opposite sex uh, more maybe than you should. Um, it makes the, maybe makes the mate feel a little bit less loved and a little less appreciated, would you say, agree? And then there's one that we all here have probably had to deal with, and maybe are dealing with, uh, and if not, you probably will deal with it, or all the three. When you're betrayed by a child, mm. we raise them, we love them, we sacrifice for them, and then as they get grown, that same child that we poured our life into. Now there's a difference between just letting you down and betraying you. All of our children will let us down from time to time, just like we let our parents down from time to time. But when that child, when they go behind the parents' back, when um, they steal from the parents, when they disrespect the parents, what was the fifth commandment? 
honor your father and mother. But it was the first commandment that was given with a promise that your days will be long on the face of the earth. Amen. So when that parent, when that child disrespects the parents, mm -hmm. uh, they talk about them, they put them down, they make fun of them. Um, that hurts when we see that happen. But I think everyone here at one time or another, we probably had a situation like that, and our parents probably had a situation like that with us. Now, one thing helps. I was telling this lady we talked to last night. She has two, a teenager and a 20-year-old. And I said, uh, well, something really helps if you'll just understand this. From the time your, your kids are 13 to the time they're 19, you know nothing. Just understand that going in. When they're teenagers, you know nothing. From the time they hit 20 and get older, every year you know a little bit more and a little bit more. If you understand that, it really helps raising kids. That's right. But as we see the situations where our trust is betrayed, just like we see with Judas here, here's the, here's the thing. You see, you can't really be betrayed unless you put your trust in somebody. That's what makes it hurt. You know, what was the saying one time somebody said, it's better to love than loss and never to love at all. And that's true. You see, because when you love, you have to open yourself up and allow yourself to be hurt. And sometimes, many times we are. The picture we have of Judas here of what he did with Jesus. Judas was trusted. How do we know that? Judas was the treasurer. Of all the twelve disciples, Judas was the treasurer. He was the one who kept the money. He was trusted. And yet, he's the one that betrayed Jesus. And we know the story very well a judge that was going to try a case and he sat down at the bench and he looked out at the lawyers. He said, I'm just going to get something straight here before we start. He said, the prosecuting attorney over here has offered me $15,000 to find in his behalf. The defense attorney over here has offered me 10000 to find on his behalf. So I'm giving him $5,000 back and I'm going to judge this case on the merits. Being betrayed buying somebody off. There's so many ways we can be betrayed. But it takes, before you can be betrayed, you have to trust somebody. There's usually love involved, but always trust. Because you can't be betrayed if you don't trust somebody. So when we put ourselves out there, but now we have a unique situation here with Judas. Is anybody here that's never asked themselves the question, why did Jesus choose Judas? He already knew. Did Jesus himself say, I've chosen you, but, what there's, but one of you will betray me? He already knew, but he chose Judas. Now you'd think, if it had been me, if I'd have been Jesus, and I, well, if I'd have been Jesus, I'd have had to do the same thing he did, because he had to follow the will of the Father. But he chose Judas because he was following the will of the Father, and he knew Judas's heart. He knew Judas's heart better than Judas knew his heart. Judas was going to be a follower of Jesus. He thought Jesus had come to deliver him, so he was going to be one of the twelve, one of the in crowd. He was going to follow him as he took over and shut the Romans down and led them to victory, but he watched him day in and day out, and Jesus didn't do any of that. So he got disillusioned. And he got to the point where it wasn't enough to take a little money out of the the money bag from time to time. He got greedy. Well, he said, if he's not going to take over, if he's not going to rule, I just won't get what I can get out of this. So he went to the Pharisees and said, what will you give me to betray him to you? We all know that story. But that's not why we're here today. Let's bring it home. 
How much would it take for you to betray Jesus? Now, your first thought is probably, I'd never betray Jesus. For any amount of money, there's no way I'd betray Jesus. Really. Good thought. How about um, you're in a crowd, a group of people, and um, somebody in the crowd tells an off-color joke, and everybody's laughing at it. Maybe you don't laugh, but you also don't say anything. What do you think Jesus thinks about that? There's so many ways that we can betray Jesus and do. Harry Arnside, an old Scottish preacher from years ago, seemed like a great old man. Told of a situation one time when he was in the smoking room with the men. That's how it used to be. All the men would go in the room and they'd all get their cigars out and smoke their cigars. And he said this lady was in the room and when she left, one of the guys turned to him and said, well, now that she's gone, i got a joke I want to tell you. Mm-hmm. Harry said, excuse me. He said, can I ask you a question? Or may I say something? He said, if you couldn't tell it with her in the room, do you really think you need to tell it now? The guy was embarrassed, but he didn't tell the joke. Folks, we need to stand for Jesus because when you don't stand for Jesus, you betray Jesus. People need to know we're Christians. And the only way they're going to know we're Christians is if we stand for Jesus, if we act like we're Christians. We don't laugh at the off-color jokes. We don't, we don't take the, the shortcuts that may be a little on the shady side. Well, about when you, you're checking out and somebody gives you too much change, you look down, you're counting your change, you realize they gave you too much change. Do you keep walking or do you turn around and go back and say, wait a minute, you gave me too much money back? There's all kinds of ways that we can betray Jesus and we do it for less than 30 pieces of silver every day. Judas took 30 pieces of silver. Anytime we compromise on our principle, we know what God's Word said. We talked about this Sunday school that it's not a problem that people don't know what God's Word says. I'm trying to think if it was uh, Will Rogers. I think it was Will Rogers. Don't hold me to this, but I think it was Will Rogers that said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't know that bother me, it's the parts that I do know. If we know what God's Word says, and yet we choose to do something other than that, are we not betraying God? Are we not compromising our principles? God has a word for it. It's called rebellion. It's called sin, if you really want to get down to the bottom line. Anytime we do something that we know God does not want us to do, we're living in rebellion to God and we're sinning against God. We're betraying God. We don't like to look at it that way. Now, we live in a society today that said there's no right or wrong. Whatever you want to do, That's perfectly okay. There's no such thing as absolute truth. I would disagree with that. My Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father by me. He said, I am the truth. The definition of truth is reality from God's point of view. There is a truth. There is an absolute. Gravity still works. Black is not white. People say, oh, well, all different religions, but they all lead to the same God. That is one of the stupidest statements you'll ever hear. You see, if this one believes one thing and this person believes just the opposite, how can you say they're all the same when they don't even agree with each other and that they all lead to the same God? Jesus said there's only one true God, and the only way you can get to him is through me. So when we compromise our principles, when we break God's laws, they're pretty clear, aren't they? Now, we have a society out here today that can ride in the streets and 
the uh, officials tell them that's okay. I don't think they're social distancing when they do that, but anyway, they say that's okay. They can destroy people's businesses. Then we look at that and turn the other cheek. <laughs> but when we break God's laws, God's laws are clear. Now, even if people say, I don't want to believe in your God. I don't believe anybody that was intellectually honest could say, if we kept the Ten Commandments, this would be a better world to live in. Amen. Now, you can say you want to believe in my God or not. That's okay. That's between you and God. You all will deal with that later. But you can't intellectually be honest and say, if we just kept the Ten Commandments, it would be a much better world to live in. But every time we break one of those laws, we betray God. Because when we ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sin, and he did, and he wiped our slate clean, and when, he looks, when God looks at us through the blood of Jesus, he doesn't see our sin anymore. He just sees his son. And any time we, we abuse that and break that law, we're betraying that trust that Jesus put in us. Judas did it for 30 pieces of silver. Here's another one for you. We don't like this one at all, so I'll just tell you before I give it to you. You're not going to like it. And you're going to say, you don't know my situation. So you just can't say that because you don't know my situation. I don't need to know your situation. I know what Jesus said. When you refuse to forgive, you are betraying Christ. What did he say in the model prayer? Now, I didn't say the Lord's Prayer. They call it the Lord's Prayer. That's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found over in John. That's the model prayer. Forgive us our debts as what? As we forgive our debtors. You realize what he's saying? Let me put it to you in another way. As you forgive other people who have sinned against you, God will forgive you for sinning against him. If you refuse to forgive other people for sinning against you, you've just dictated how you want God to judge you. Now, is there anybody here, I'll take a show of hands on this one, is there anybody here when you stand before God you're willing to just be judged the way you're judging. All you want is justice. May I have a show of hands, please? Hmm. Well, at least you didn't break the ninth commandment. Thank you for being honest. No, we all want mercy, don't we? We want grace. Well, that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is grace. Forgiveness is giving mercy. You're never more like Jesus than when you forgive. And you're never more like the devil when you don't. But they don't deserve to be forgiven. Do you? Anybody here deserve to be forgiven? Where would everybody here end up if God just gave us all justice? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But many of us or like the man in 18th chapter of Matthew. You remember where the, the man owed the king 10,000 talents. Now in today's money, that's billions of dollars. In other words, there's no way he could ever, ever, ever pay it back. And he went to the king and he begged the king to forgive him. And the king said, okay, I forgive you. I forgive your debt. And he walked away feeling pretty good because he just got forgiven a debt that he could never pay. By the way, when you got saved, you got forgiven a debt you could never pay. We know the story. He went out, he met a man that owed him a hundred denarii. Small pittance. He told the guy, pay me what you owe me. And the guy said, but I, but I, but I can't, if you'll just give me time, I'll pay you back. And instead, he took the man and he threw him in debtor's prison. We all know the, we know the story. When the story got back to the king, 
He called the men back in and said, I forgave you all that debt and you couldn't forgive him that and he took him and threw him in prison. And since that price could never be paid, he stayed in prison. I'm afraid many of us are like that. You see, the king is Jesus. Amen. And when we came to Jesus and we said, Lord, forgive me, I've sinned against you, forgive me, I pray, I can't pay the price for it. But Jesus said, I forgive you, I pay the price. Hallelujah. But then, we turn around. And we have somebody that sins against us. And they come to us and say, I'm, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? No. You hurt my feelings. I don't agree. I don't, I'm mad at what you did. I can't forgive you. Remember the parable? One day, we're going to stand back before the king again. One day, Jesus is going to remind us of what he forgave us for. And we're going to have to give an account. And when he sees that we didn't forgive, do you really want to stand before Jesus without mercy and without grace? I don't. And I don't think you do either. What Jesus is saying in that parable is if I can forgive all the sins that you've sinned against me and continue to sin because even as Christians we sin, if I can forgive that, you can forgive. And if you don't, he said, I will judge you just the way you judge them. James chapter 2, verse 13. He said, judgment will be merciless to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Do you want God's mercy? Anybody here want God's mercy? Amen. Show mercy. If you want God's mercy, show mercy. I believe if Judas had to turn around and come back to Jesus and said, I'm sorry, I made a terrible mistake. I didn't realize what I was doing. Lord, I'm sorry they beat you like this. I'm sorry this happened, Lord. It's all my fault. Will you forgive me? Jesus would have, you're forgiven. Because yeah. nobody has ever come to Jesus Christ and asked him to forgive them. And he's not one time has he ever said, no, I can't forgive that. He would have forgiven Judas. Just like he forgave Peter when he denied him three times. But Judas didn't ask for forgiveness. He went out and hung himself. He died lost. But notice something about this story with Judas. We all know who was involved here. We, we know the story. Folks, it was the religious crowd of the day that killed Jesus. It was the social gospel crowd of the day, if you will. We've got a social gospel out there today just... Everybody wants to be do-gooders and we want to give these people this this, and do this for these people and give this to them. Oh, you can help them all you want to. You can take a, if you could go find a, a hundred thousand people and you give each one of them food to eat, tomorrow they're going to be hungry again. There's people say, well, why doesn't the church take all that money that they, they use for this and use for that? Why don't they just give that to the poor people? Why don't they feed the poor people? Let me tell you something. Anytime a pastor stands in the pulpit, and preaches the word of God, he's feeding the poor people. Amen. He's feeding them something that will last for eternity, yeah. not something that will feed them for one day. Judas was with the crowd. He was with the in crowd. He was with the religious crowd. The religious crowd put Jesus on a cross. Ephesians chapter 4, and Paul said in verse 31, 32, he said, let, let all bitterness and anger and, and wrath and clamor and slander be put away from you along with, with all the malice. Be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted. Forgiving each other, here it is, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. I think Paul had a pretty good handle on it. 
So what do you do when somebody betrays you? You know, the word forgive, when Jesus is on the cross and said, Father, forgive them, you know what the word forgive technically means? The word forgive means to pay a debt. When he said, Father, forgive them, that's why he went ahead and he said, it is finished. The debt was paid. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, Paul made it clarified. He said, in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Now here's where we run into the problem. When we forgive somebody, it costs us something. It costs you to forgive. It's not free. And if somebody, one of you owed me $1,000, that would be good, by the way. If one of you owed me $1,000, and I came to you and I said, you said, I can't pay that $1,000, and I said, okay, I forgive it. Now, you're forgiven, but it just cost me $1,000. It cost us to forgive, even when we're betrayed. But we are to forgive. I heard Adrian Rogers tell a story one time of a man who was working for a company, and he found out that he'd been skimming some money off the books, and they sent him to the manager's office. He knew he was going to get fired. He went in. The manager said, did you do this? He said, yes, sir, I did. I'm guilty. The manager said, can you tell me why? And he explained to him. He said, there's no excuse. I did it. He said, well, all right. He said, let me tell you something. He said, if I put you back to work, can I trust you to never, ever do this again? The man said, oh, I promise. He said, if you would just let me keep, uh, put me back to work and trust me. He said, I promise you I'll never, ever do this again. He said, all right, go back to work. He said, well, before you leave, let me tell you something. He said, many years ago, he said, you're not the first one that's ever done this. Many years ago, when I first started in this company, he said, I did something very similar. They sent me to the owner of the company. He said, the owner gave me a second chance. And I'm giving you a second chance. Don't disappoint me. That's forgiveness. He wasn't asking anything in return. It was forgiveness. So why should we forgive? Why is it so important for us to give when we're betrayed? Why is it so important to forgive people who betray us? Because the Bible says unforgiveness brings grief. In fact, it says somewhere, Junior used to quote this a lot, Junior Hill used to quote, uh, unforgiveness makes the bones wax cold. That's what the Old Testament says. You know people that are unforgiving? They're bitter, aren't they? They're bitter. Nothing makes them happy. They're bitter at the world. They're bitter at everybody. They're never happy. And they think it's everybody else's fault, and they don't realize it's their fault. Because they refuse to forgive others. And this bitterness builds up inside them and, and just ruins their life. By the way, when you don't forgive somebody, you're not bothering them a bit. They just go about their merry way, live their life, but it'll eat at you like a cancer. It'll destroy you from within. Some of you are shaking your head because you know what I'm telling you is true because you've been there. Man. You know what it feels like. Judas didn't have a chance to repent, or he had a chance and didn't take it. But then, how many times have you heard this? Somebody does something to somebody, and they say, here it is. But I'll get even. I'll get even. I'll make them pay, and then after I make them pay so long, then I might forgive them. You realize what you're saying when you say, I'll get even. You're up here. They're down here because they have sinned and they've betrayed you. And you said, I'm going to get even. <laughs> You're going to come from up here. You're going to go down here and be with them on their level. Mm -hmm. When you don't forgive, you're just coming down to their level, folks. That's right. That's all you're doing. You don't, you're not high and mighty. You're coming down to, you're right. You're going to get even. You're going to come down to their level. Mm -hmm. Do you really want to get on the same level with somebody that would treat you like that? Forgive them. One of my favorite, I quoted this recently to somebody, I won't tell you who, but I said, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and it's probably not because, it's probably not for the right reason, but I'll just tell you. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 and 20, basically what God says is, 
You forgive them, let me judge them, and the more you forgive them, I'll heap hot burning coals on their head. He said, I'll do the judging. Let me do the judging. You just forgive them. That's probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and probably for the wrong reasons. And don't just say, well, I uh, apologize. Well, if I hurt as I signed apology. When, when you ask for forgiveness, you say, would you forgive me? Not I'll apologize if I did anything. Would you forgive me? There was a, a earl, a nobleman one time who named Tom, uh, Thomas Wentworth, and he went before King Charles, and he had done something that he was in danger from the king, but the king wrote him a letter, and he said, basically in the letter, he said, if you'll come to the city, he said, here's the letter you can bring with you. I will protect you. I will keep you safe, and nothing will happen to you. So he brought the letter with him. He came to the city, and he stayed for a short time, but then right after that, some people came against him. The same king signed another letter that put him to death. The same king that said, if you'll just come and bring this letter, it'll protect you, wrote another letter condemning him to death. Wentworth's last words as he was, before they hung him, put not your trust in princes. Folks, men will always fail you. People will betray you. The question is, when you're betrayed, will you forgive? We must forgive. If we're going to be like Jesus, we must forgive. We don't have a choice. Not if we're going to serve Jesus. But I have good news. He said, don't put your trust in Jesus. Let me tell you something. There's one prince you can put your trust in. He's the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and He'll never betray you. He will never let you down. He will always do what He says He will do. You can trust that Prince. So if we put our trust in Jesus, we know that we won't be betrayed. But folks, if we're going to put our trust in Jesus, we have to do what Jesus did. We can't expect Jesus to forgive us if we're not willing to forgive others when we betray him. By the way, Jesus will never betray you. He loves you. Amen. He went to that cross for you. He died on that cross to pay a debt. I said forgiveness. Paid a debt that could and if we couldn't pay. He paid it. And he did it because he loves us. Judas had every chance in the world. He threw them all away. Sure, he, I know he felt remorse. He wouldn't have went out and hung himself. But isn't it amazing? All the time he lived with Jesus, he never understood it. All he had to do was ask Jesus to forgive him, and Jesus would have forgiven him on the spot if he had just asked. And that's all we have to do. No matter what we've done, no matter how long, how many times we've done it, 